Amen. Look at your neighbor right now and say, Christmas is coming. Now say it like you mean it. Come on, are y'all excited about Christmas or what? The kids in the room is like, I'm excited. Yeah, that's great. But I'll tell you what, Christmas is coming here at Compassion. And today we are actually starting a brand new series called Christmas is Coming. But before I get into the first uh, uh, portion of that series, I do want to tell you December the 19th, write it down if you want, but December the 19th at 5 p.m. begins our Christmas at Compassion services. And we're going to be encouraging you to invite all of your friends, all of your family members, different things like that. Some of you probably got some of these cards when you came in. If you didn't, we'll hand you one uh, later on in the service. But we want you to begin to think about and pray about who do I want to invite? Who do I feel like in my family needs Christ? And it's very easy to get them to a service like Christmas at Compassion, okay? Because again, we don't want to be stuck within these four walls. We want to reach out. So we care just as much about your lost loved ones as we do about you. Amen? We want to see your whole family saved in Jesus' name. Not only your family, but your friends. And even some of you, your boss needs to be saved. Come on, can I get a witness? All right, some of you need to do that. Turn your Bible to John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. And we're going to start here in the scripture to begin, Christmas is coming. And today, if I had uh, to title my sermon, it would be this, keep hoping. Keep hoping, because there's a lot of lost hope Today in our society, in our culture, and especially in the season that we've been in since the beginning of this year. A lot of people have just lost hope. So I hope today this text really inspires you. I've chosen John chapter 1 to begin with because I really believe that this really brings everything back and shows us exactly that, that, that God had a plan from the very beginning. He did, okay? Y'all ready? Here we go. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning, somebody say in the beginning. When is that? In the beginning, right? So from the very beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. It was almost like John said, I hope that you get this, that he even repeats himself. He was with God in the beginning. And the word here is talking about Jesus. So in the beginning was the word. Jesus was there. And the word was with God and the word was God. Verse 3, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Verse 4, in him was what? Life. And that was the light of all mankind and the light that shines in the darkness and the darkness, listen, has not overcome it. Do you, do you understand no matter what happens in your life, the darkness will not overcome the light of the world and his name is Jesus Christ. Thank you right here for getting excited, Texas A&M. Come on, girl. Y'all done beat LSU yesterday. You'd be praising God right now. You know, but it, I, I wanted to read that to lay a foundation to let you know that God had a plan from the very beginning. And when our lives begin to fall apart or things don't begin to work out the way that we think that they should, we got to go back and say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. We just got to start quoting those things over our life. Why? Because God has a plan. He has a plan. And we're actually in the midst of this journey leading up to the birth of Christ. And, and, and in traditional settings, there's this thing celebrated called Advent. And it's four weeks. It's the four Sundays, the four weeks leading up to Christmas morning. December the 25th is what we would call Christmas morning. I don't want to get into all the theology, but Jesus wasn't born on December the 25th. I hate to, you know, spoil everything for you, but it's the day we celebrate. Amen? But there's these four candles. I just threw everybody for a loop right then. You mean to tell me Jesus wasn't born on December the 25th? Just go back and study and read and stuff. This is our celebration time of Christ being born. There was four candles in this Advent season, which is a season season of eagerly expecting the coming of the Messiah. And I hope you understand that we should all be in eager expectation 
of the coming of the Messiah. That's the part of Advent that people celebrate. And there's four candles in Advent, as you can see on my table today. Vaboom! I've got one of the candles because this is the first candle that is lit on the first week. And this candle, it's always a purple candle. Uh, purple, you know, represents royalty. And, and it's the first candle. And the candle here represents hope. It represents hope. And here's what I like about the story of Christmas, because when we sanitize the Christmas story, we literally, we strip it of its significance. Does that make sense? Oh, looky there. It's precious baby Jesus laying in the nice crib that they got from Babies R Us. Amen. Look at Mary and Joseph with a big smile on their face. Hallelujah. When you sanitize the Christmas story, you actually strip it of its significance. Because the truth is, it wasn't a pretty situation. Could you imagine your teenage daughter coming up to you and saying, hey, Dad, I, I just want to set you guys down, and I want you to let you know that I'm, I'm pregnant. And then Dad goes, pregnant? Where's Joseph at? I can't believe that Joseph, you're betrothed to be married to him. The consummation is not, shouldn't have happened yet. And she goes, no, Daddy, <laughs> the Holy Spirit impregnated me. Hallelujah. <laughs> If, if, there, if there was a time that someone slapped someone in the Bible, it was probably when, she, when, when Mary said that to her daddy. I mean, I'm sure that there was just this slap, and I know that I probably just messed some of y'all up again there for a minute. Like, no, people didn't slap each other. I promise you people slap people in biblical days. But here's this story that's a little messy. It's a messy Christmas. It's messy, and not only that, there was no hope for the people. Here's... Here's this hope, this promise of a Messiah. Here's this young virgin child that has been impregnated by the Holy Spirit himself. And, and there's hope that's coming to the world, but the people in the world didn't feel the hope, especially the Gentiles. And I don't know who you know Gentiles is, but just look to your left. Now look to your right. Those were Gentiles. Amen. So if you're a non-Jewish person, they would call you a Gentile. And there was no hope for the Gentiles, right? And even the Jewish people, they were under law. And when I say under law, they were under 633 of them. Look at your neighbor right now and say 633. Yeah, 633 laws. And no one was able to uphold these laws or uphold the standard that was actually set. No one was able to do that. And on top of all of that, God wasn't speaking. You ever went through a season in your life where God didn't speak? Come on, y'all are going to have to get into this just a little bit more. You know, have y'all ever went through a season in your life where God didn't speak? Yeah, yeah okay. And, and here's what you have to understand in this story. God hadn't spoke for 400 years. 400 years. Could you, could you imagine 400 years of silence? Not only 400 years of silence, but... My goodness, no matter what you did, you couldn't do it right, it wasn't good enough. I mean, can you actually imagine what these people are going through? 400 years. We, we, can't, we can't even go two weeks without getting upset with God. God, I laid a fleece out before you yesterday, and you still haven't talked to me because we live in a microwave generation. What if it was 400 years? Could you imagine generation after generation after generation of people who were depending on their forefathers, the people who had said that God was, was coming and that he had a promised Messiah that was coming. I mean, after 400 years, you would almost just give up, wouldn't you? Because for us, I mean, most of the time, if we're just waiting, I mean, heck, a year, and God had not spoken a year, I'm just going to give up on God. You can't give up on God. Why? Because there's hope of a Messiah. There's hope. Are y'all, am I making sense to anybody in this room today? I mean, just, just imagine because no one likes waiting. We don't like waiting. Raise your hand if you like waiting right now. We'll be in the fast food line at McDonald's, and, and the, the little lady just went to get a drink real quick and come right back, and it's been 32 seconds, and we're already huffing and puffing and throwing our card at her like she's the devil or something, you know, because we don't like waiting. It feels good to get what we want when we want it. 
You know, could you imagine these people and it felt good for them? Man, if God's going to speak, he needs to speak now. Well, God's going to speak and God's going to do what he wants to do in his timing, not your timing, not my timing. But the truth is when our expectations, if you have expectations in your life, when they're delayed, we begin to experience things called disappointment or disillusionment or maybe there's a little bit of loss of hope in our life. Because, I mean, God's just not talking. God's not saying anything. Listen to this in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12. Check this out real quick. It says, hope deferred. Say deferred. Come on, y'all know y'all like those deferred payments at the bank. Come on, somebody. Everybody knows what deferred means, right? But the Bible here says hope deferred. When the hope of Christ is deferred, it makes the heart sick. But listen to what it says. It says, but when the desire comes, it's a tree of life. So hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when that desire comes, whoa, it's a tree of life. Why? Because there's hope that comes back. It's almost like a revived hope. How many golfers do I have in the room? Anybody? Yeah, yeah. Actually, several golfers in this one. Everybody else was like, ain't nobody playing golf? You know, last service, but several golfers. I, I love golf and I hate golf all in one sentence. Where's my golfers at? You know what I'm talking about? Because hope deferred makes the heart sick. You go to, you, go to, you know, number one, especially you go out to Greystone. I think it's like number three or number four. Maybe it's number three. And, and you hit, I mean, I always hook it left and I lose balls like crazy out there. It's hope deferred. I don't know if I can play this game, but on the 18th hole, come on, somebody. All you got to do, and, and by then you're just mad. You're mad and you're like, man, I'm just going to get out of here. Yeah. Line up a little bit here, you know. And then when you swing that thing, bah, it's like, oh, my God. Did you see that? And it's straight down the fairway, you know, and you just drove that baby about 275 yards. Come on now. I don't know if I could drive it that long. But, you know, it just goes, and it's like a tree of life. In that moment, I go, I got to come back next week, play some golf, man. I'm telling you. It's like there's some hope for me. But deferred there means to put off or to drag out, as in a long, drawn-out process. Has anybody ever been in a long, drawn-out process? Just a long, drawn-out process. That's when hope is deferred. When we wait, listen, when we wait so long that desire and expectation turn to hopelessness, here's what happens. We become spiritually dried up and vulnerable to the enemy's attacks. And I think right now in this season, can I just speak to the season for a minute? In this season, a lot of people have been spiritually dried up, and it's, it's making us vulnerable to the enemy's attacks. And then before too long, the person that you seen fired up for God back in February of 2020 is now sitting back in the bar in December of 2020. Am I with you? Are you with me? Come on. And, and, and what happens is that hope has been deferred and we've allowed everything around us to distract us from what God wants for us. So because of that, we get sidetracked. We get off of what God has called us to be. Now, write this down if you have it. I want you to write this down because I think this is one of the most important statements I'm going to make all day. But our unfulfilled desires and deferred hopes can lead us to rich encounters with Jesus. Come on. Our unfulfilled desires and deferred hopes can lead us to rich encounters with Jesus. I don't know who I'm speaking to today, but maybe there's some desires that are unfulfilled. Maybe there's some hopes and some dreams and some aspirations that have been deferred, but let God use that to bring forth some rich encounters with him. Here's why. Because the truth was, even in this story that I'm talking about today, salvation was on its way. There was hope. Just like you and I in our life today, there is hope. You say, well, there's no hope for me. I'm telling you right now, I don't care where you're at. I don't care who you're from. I don't care what your family background is or what you did last night. I'm telling you right now, there is hope hope for you. Why? Because hope has a name and his name is Jesus. Amen. There's hope. We have hope. Isaiah chapter 11, verse one. Y'all going to love this. We're going to take a little forestry lesson in the word today. Here we go. A shoot. Say a shoot. 
will come up from the stump of Jesse, from his roots, a branch, big B, branch will bear fruit. You're probably going, man, what the heck does this have to do with anything? Here's what I want you to understand. Let me read that scripture just one more time. And it says a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. A shoot's going to come up from the stump. Now, you know what a stump is, don't you? You know what a stump is? A stump is from something that was cut down. Have you ever cut down an old tree that you didn't like? And then a couple years later, you go back and there's these branches that's coming up out of the stump. Y'all ever done that? You tried to get rid of it? See, that's what the enemy's trying to do in your life. He's trying to get rid of you. And what he don't understand is that a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. It's talking about Jesus right here in the book of Isaiah. From his root, a branch, Jesus, will begin to come forth and he's going to bear fruit. How does Jesus bear fruit? Through people like you and I. There's hope. And here's a word for somebody today. Something that the enemy had cut down still has promise. Will you allow me to preach just for a minute? Do I have permission to preach because this just goes all through me? Something that the enemy had cut down. I believe under the sound of my voice that there's people in here that you've literally seen the enemy sneak into your life. Maybe that marriage was cut down to the stump. Maybe those children were cut down to the stump. Maybe those finances were cut down to the stump. I don't know your situation. Maybe you lost your job and here you are back on ground level, but something that the enemy had cut down still has promise. There's there's still promise for you and you and you and you because God is on the throne. There's promise. We have hope. Why do we have hope? Because of who Christ is. That's why we have hope. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 15, verses 12 and 13. Let's read this together. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse, this is where the book of Romans begins to identify what the book of Isaiah had just said that we read. He said, the root of Jesse will spring up and one who, or, or one who will arise to rule over the nations, in him the Gentiles will hope. In him we will hope. Where does our hope come from? Our hope comes from Jesus, right? Verse 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. My goodness gracious, if we've ever read any scriptures that should be inspiring to each and every one of us, I just read it right there. Do you know that when Isaiah was pinning his stuff, that was 700 years before Jesus was born? 700 years. And here we are living in that moment. Some people go, yeah, I just don't know all this stuff. I just don't know all this stuff. Who's the first president of the United States? Who is it? Talk to me. Don't lock up. I know you're from Dixon County, but we smart around him. Amen. Who said it? Georgia, how do you know? How do you know George Washington was the first president of the United States? You wasn't here. Oh, somebody says history. Well, how do you know somebody just didn't make it up? How do you know? The reason we know is because we, we know that there was people in the very beginning that kept passing that down, and we, we get history from that. All this is right here is a huge history book, and what the Bible says is true, and it's real, and 700 years before Jesus ever came out of the mother's womb, Mary's womb, Isaiah was prophesying about this guy that was going to come forth and this branch that was going to bear fruit in our lives. We have. Guys, do you understand that we are now living in what Isaiah, the prophet in the Bible, was hoping for? We're living in what he was hoping for. I wonder if we take it for granted because we have it. You ever took something for granted just because you have it? Come on. Sometimes we take our parents for granted because we have them. But then when they're no longer there, we miss the moments that we could have shared with them. Does that make sense? I wonder if we're missing some moments that we could share with Christ and where Christ could give us the peace and the comfort and the joy that we need in this very moment, but we take it for granted and we allow life to overcome us and we allow 
this, this world that we're living in to blow out our hope. We don't have hope. But here's the thing. If you don't have hope today, guess what? It's that easy. All you got to do is come back, right? Romans chapter 8, verse 24 and 25. Check this out. It's pretty cool. For in this hope that I just talked about, we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. When you see hope, it's not really hope because you see it right in front of you, right? Who hopes for what they already have? Verse 25, but if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it, what, how? Patiently. We wait for it patiently. So now in those days, in biblical days, before Christ was born, they were hoping for the coming of the Messiah. So where is our hope now? We're hoping for the coming of the Messiah. Now, our hope is not in his first coming. Our hope is in his second coming. It is when Jesus Christ is going to blow a trumpet. And when the trumpet sounds, the eastern sky is going to split open. And the Bible says that the dead will rise first. And we're going to be called up together with him in the air. We have hope. We have hope. That's who we are. See, but the thing about it is, let, let's take it to a practical standpoint, though, because we have hope when good things are happening. Come on now. Permission to meddle? Okay, thank you for the permission. I appreciate it. Y'all are awful quiet today, but we have, we have hope when good things are happening. But how is your hope when God's not speaking? How's your hope when God's not speaking? Do you want to just stay home? Do you want to just, just say, hey, you know what, I'm just not... I'm not going to do this Christianity stuff. Apparently, God just don't love me. I haven't heard God. Everybody else around me is saying that God is speaking to them and God's doing great things for them. Here I am. I, I've, I've lost hope. What about when your life's not bearing fruit? I believe in seasons like this. I pray for my pastor friends. If any of my pastor friends are listening to me, I actually got one pastor friend in the room with me, Pastor Tommy Hodges, Pastor's Compassion Church in Kennett, Missouri. Give it up for Pastor Tommy and his beautiful bride back in the back, Miss Amy. We love you. Tommy came to our church one Sunday and stole one of our worship team people. Stole her and married her. It was crazy. So, Amy, it's good to see you back. But, but I pray for all of the, the churches and leadership in churches today because the enemy's trying to steal our hope. He's trying to steal the hope of the church. And it's my personal belief that the, the, that the hope for the world is the local church. Amen? The activated church. We are the hope for the world. But what are you going to do when you have hope for provision and, and you're down to nothing? What are you going to do? God's going to provide. Have y'all ever went through closets before? I've been here. I've done this before. Have you ever went through closets before? Some of y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. Go get your piggy bank. Y'all know what I'm talking about now? You know, go get your piggy bank. Well, mama, can we not take this up to Kroger and let the machine count it for us? No, 3% goes to Kroger. I'm saving 3%. Get your tail at the kitchen table, and we're going to count pennies and dimes and nickels and quarters. That's what we're going to do tonight. Right? Hope for provision when you're down to nothing. Hope for reconciliation when it looks like it won't happen. Where's your hope then? See, here's what I personally believe. True hope does not know how or what or when. True hope knows who. It's not about how, what, when. Oh, my gosh, where's it going to come from? No, it's who. Because Christ is our only hope. And according to scripture that we read in Hebrews chapter 11, hope lies beneath the surface. Some of you are looking for your hope today. Well, I mean, if things just looked up for me, I'd be a little bit more hopeful, Pastor Jamie. You got to dig deeper than that. Our word for 2020 was rooted. Y'all remember that? Rooted, rooted, right? Isaiah said, from the root of Jesse, it shall spring forth. Where are the roots at? Under the ground. Roots are hidden. There's some things in your life that are hidden, that are about to come to fruition, that is going to be great, great hope for you. Amen. 
What hope, just think about it just for a moment. What hope do you have living on the inside of you? Some of you need to dig down into your spirit and begin to pull out hope and get rid of all of that negativity and all the discouragement and all the depression and begin to pull out the hope that is on the inside of you that was planted in you when you gave your life to Jesus Christ. My goodness gracious. You see, sometimes we live in such a practical way that our hope lies in things. And things, if God took away your whole bank account tomorrow, where is your hope? And people, if he took away all your relationships, where is your hope? If he took away all your success, where is your hope? If he took away all your social status, where is your hope? I'll tell you where your hope should be. Your hope should be in Jesus Christ. Nothing more, nothing less. When I'm talking about this hope, I'm talking about a hope that will not disappear. It will not disappear. See, it disappears in people, and it disappears in things, and it disappears in success, and it disappears in all of our little social statuses and our little, our little groups that we're part of. It'll disappear. Those things leave. Those things go away. But my God, your God stays the same today, yesterday, and forever. Amen? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, and I'm almost done. Just give me another 30 minutes. Let us hold unswervingly. Somebody say unswervingly. Unswervingly. Now listen, let us hold unswervingly. When I read that this week as I'm preparing this sermon, actually I read this specific verse yesterday on my way back home from Missouri and I threw it into my sermon because I thought, man, this is really good, but let us hold unswervingly. Jill, my beautiful wife, was driving for me so that I could pray over my sermon and, and just kind of prep everything that's going to be happening today. And, and I thought about someone driving a car and when they're not distracted, have you ever drove a car distracted? Have you ever been a, behind someone that was driving a car distracted? All over the road, swerving all over the road, all over the world. But here's what God's word says. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. In other words, hold on to that steering wheel of your spiritual car. And don't you look to the left and don't you look to the right. Why? Because God don't want you to get distracted and go off track just a little bit. Hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. Why? For he who promised is faithful. Kenzie sang a great song. That team just blew it out on that second song today about God's faithfulness. In all our lives, he's been faithful. How many of you know that God's been faithful all of our lives? Yes, he's been faithful. If you want to build a family that lasts, hope in this word. Hope in his word, not in this world. If you say, man, I want to build something that lasts. If you want to build something that lasts, right here is your key. But the majority of the time, and I'm not trying to beat anybody up because I live this life too, but the majority of the time, we're too busy to read God's word. We're too busy to lay a hold of some of the hope that God has for us. Maybe God's got some hope that he wants to bring out of you that's in those roots. Maybe he wants a little branch to, to peek out in the morning, but you're going to get so busy in the morning with all the cares of this world and all these things that you won't trust in his word. Hope in his word is the anchor, the Bible says, of our souls. I mentioned this, and I thought it was a good analogy. Uh, me and Jill went on a little mini vacation, just the two of us. We try to do that every year. Most Sometimes it don't happen, but after this year, we made a pact and said it will happen. No kids, no nothing, which, you know, Kaylee's up here and she's 21 and she's got her boyfriend with her and Abby's 17 and she's graduating high school this year and Kaylee lives in Oklahoma and you know it's it's almost time for us to kind of transition into that then come along little river and you know we got a four-year-old but we're go we're gonna do this right we're, we're gonna we're gonna take some time together and it come to my mind when I talked about anchors we went uh, down into Florida, and we rented a boat. Y'all ever rent, rented a boat by yourself? You just go and rent this boat. And it actually wasn't expensive. We were shocked at how cheap it was. And uh, we rent this boat, and we had it for four hours, I think. Had it for four hours, and we got it on the Gulf side of the ocean. And there was this little inlet that we could drive around. And then when you come out, it's this vast ocean. I mean, you're by yourself. 
And they're like, just take it, bring it back in four hours. I'm like, dude, you're from Dixon, Tennessee. I love you. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's like we're at home right here. These people talk like us. They look like us. They just trusted me, you know, with a boat. And, and we get out there. But before we left, the guy said, hey, just be sure uh, if you're going to anchor down somewhere, just be sure you're looking at your depth finder. And here's how many feet the anchor can go down. And I thought, oh, okay. So, so we took it upon ourselves. It was absolutely beautiful. Dolphins are all over the place. It's great. So we're out in the middle of the ocean. And I look at the depth finder, and it wasn't deep enough for me to let my anchor down. So if we would have stayed in that moment with the motor off, we would have drifted a long way because my anchor wasn't down. That, that would have been a, a lack of hope. Okay, And I believe that there's some people, maybe even in this room, that your, your anchor is not down. And you're looking at your depth finder and your spiritual boat. And you're going, I don't have enough rope to anchor down right now. I guess I'm just going to have to keep drifting and drift, drifting. Here's the difference in that natural boat and your spiritual boat. That natural boat had a natural anchor that could go down so many feet. You have an anchor that can go as deep as you need. And some of you, you need God being your anchor to go 100 feet deep. Some of you, it's 200 feet deep. Some of you, it's just five foot. But God is a vast God. He's an amazing God. And the Bible said that he's faithful. Amen. One more scripture and I'm done. Psalm 135, chapter 130, verse 5. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word, I anchor down. I put my hope. In his word, I'm going to put my hope. Why? Because with God, all things are possible. Let me tell you something. Hope is here today. Hope is here today. All you have to do is get a hold of it. Some of you may be like, man, I just don't have that hope. It's good that you get up there and preach that. I don't have that hope, but you can have that hope. Because the truth is, God is no respecter of persons. What he's done for me, he'll do for you. You just got to get into his word. You got to give him your life. Amen? You don't have to leave this place without hope. God is our hope. What I want to do this morning is our altar teams are going to come up just here in a moment, and we're just going to spend some time in prayer. It's only going to take us five, seven, seven minutes, something like that. If it takes longer, it takes longer. If it don't, it's fine. But we're going to play another song just here in a moment. But here's what I want to ask you. I want to ask you a two-fold question. What or who, what or who are you hoping for right now? What are you hoping for in your life? Or maybe some of you, God's really been doing some great things in your life, but now it's a who. Who are you hoping for? This is where, as a church, I want to just partner with you guys. You don't have to put your name, phone number, and email up here if you don't want to. Just eliminate that if you want. But what we call these is just, we actually call them on staff our top five cards. And what we're saying is, man, if you're hoping for somebody in this Christmas, we want to partner with you to hope for those people. And here's my commitment as a pastor and the staff's commitment. There's going to be times throughout the week that the staff takes these cards and we pray these names out loud. There's going to be a moment in my personal prayer time, not even with the staff, but just my personal prayer time that I'm going to go through these cards every day between now and December the 19th and 20th. And I'm going to cry out to God the names that you write on this because there's a lot of people in our community, not, not just us, but there's a lot of people that have lost hope. And we need that hope. Amen? So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray over you just in a minute. But during our prayer time today, if you feel led to fill this out, I want you to just fill this out and come and drop it behind the screen. And, and you don't have to put your name, phone number, email if you don't want to. You can just put the names. You can write a little something up there if you want, whatever you want to do. But let's just turn this place into a house of prayer for people who need the hope of Jesus Christ. Can we do that today? Let me pray with you, if, if you would. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe you're in this room and you say, Pastor Jamie, I've lost hope. I know what you're saying, and I'm one of those people that it's been quite some time since God's done something in my life, and, and I really want God to do something now. I need this hope. Well, I can't promise you today that God's going to speak to you today, but here's what I can promise you. I can promise you when you let your request be made known to God that the peace that surpasses all understanding will come upon you, and that's what I can pray for you. 
or with you about today. Maybe you're in this room and you say, man, I've allowed a lot of these things to come into my life and rob me of hope. Online church, listen to me. In person, just, just listen to what I'm saying today because you don't want to leave here the same way that you walked in. And if that's you and you say, man, I'm, I'm just kind of walking through some stuff, I'm going through some stuff, I, I need a fresh start, maybe you need to confess some sins over to God and, and just start afresh and brand new right now today. If that's you, nobody's looking around, every head's bowed, every eye's closed, would you just slip up your hand real quick? If you're online, let them know. Online uh, hosts, you can communicate to them of how they can let you know. Just lift your hands right now if that's you. I've lost hope, Pastor Jamie. I need the hope of Christ. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else? Ah, thank you right there. Thank you right there. Anybody else? Yes, up there. I see you. Anybody else? You say, that's me. Yes, thank you right there. Anybody else? Yes, I see your hand. Let me pray with you today. Say, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Today, I pray for hope. Would you rule and reign in my life? Mold me and make me into your image. Use me from this moment on. I give you my all. My hope lies in you. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, give God a big hand clap today. People are giving their life to him. It's good. If you would, stand to your feet. The altar team are up here. They're, they're just here to pray with you, to support, support you. If you would, please don't leave during this time unless you absolutely have to. This is a sacred moment. We would love for you to just kind of stay around and be here with us and, and allow God to speak to you. As they go through this song one more time, if you want to come for prayer, do that. If you want to bring those cards, lay them at the altar, do that. If you want to take communion in your seats with your family, you're more than welcome to do that. Father, I thank you for this altar time today. I thank you for saving our souls, for helping us be who we are today. I just pray that you'll bring these people forward. Let us lay all of our things down at, down at your feet today. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys come.